Welcome back to the 21 Convention, guys. Our next speaker has been involved in the uh, pharmaceutical industry for many years. Uh, he's attempted to better the nation's health uh, through the use of pharmaceuticals. However, uh, when he began to improve his own life through uh, diet and exercise, he began to see an incongruence between what he was doing in the pharmaceutical industry and the way he was leading his own life. So when he saw an opportunity to partner with Efficient Exercise in Austin, Texas, he sees that opportunity and uh, he's been very successful and effective ever since. Please welcome to the stage, Keith Norris. What's up guys? Just want to say, and ladies, <laughs> just want to say that uh, how excited I am to be here speaking with you guys and uh, just want to thank Anthony and uh, Ehrman, Steve, for putting this on. Good, good stuff here. Um, to go into a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper of why I can stand here in front of you and speak as a, as an expert on physical culture. Um, it's been a long, long learning experience. Um, just to quickly dive into uh, to my youth, at about uh, 12 years old, I'm really going to date myself here, but at about 12 years old, I had a number of things happen in close proximity to one another. One of those was meeting Arnold Schwarzenegger and. Um, at, at an opening of a sporting goods store. This was in 1975, um, right about the time of the 75 Olympia. Um, also at that time, Pumping Iron, if any, any of you have ever seen that documentary, that was just about to roll out. Um, also, if you can remember at that time, also um, the 76 Olympics were gearing up, and as a young kid, I was really following uh, Bruce Jenner at that time. Um, and the first Rocky movie came out. So all of these things kind of came together to a kid who was just getting into uh, uh, playing football in Central Texas, which is huge. It's, it's a religion in Central Texas. I was also involved in martial arts and AAU track and field. And I was lucky enough to be surrounded by coaches who were forward thinking enough to, to show me and to teach me that one, I could better myself through physical training, through training for these different events, and not just rely on any kind of, any kind of uh, inherited talent that I might have had, which was, I will say, limited. Because I continued on in the physical culture and in the pursuit of working out to better myself so I could compete on a higher level, knowing all the time that my, the, the, the talents I came into this world were rather limited. So I trained myself to be better. Um, but anyway, those three things, uh, meeting Arnold face to face, and I can say that at that time he was an enormous human being, enormous, and as a 12-year-old kid, I was just starstruck. But also at that same time, I remember following Bruce Jenner and thinking, that guy's a phenomenal athlete, but he does not look anything like Arnold, so what, what's going on here? Obviously, obviously, we train for two different things. We train for aesthetic purposes, hypertrophy. We also train to better ourselves in, in an athletic environment. And I was trying to piece this together as a 12-year-old kid, and that's what started my, my path to physical culture. I knew there had, to be, there had to be something there on top of genetics. Obviously, certain people are geared genetically towards hypertrophy and, and towards aesthetic ends. There are also people who are geared genetically towards an expression of this in the more athletic realm. And there's a whole lot of people, probably everyone in this room, including myself, who's somewhere in the middle. What gets neglected normally when we talk about physical culture are these people in the middle. Most everything you read is geared towards a high-end athlete. So then it's up to you to try to figure out, if the high-end athlete is doing this, what do I do? I don't have that time. I don't have time to spend four, five, six hours a day on the track in the gym. I just don't have time to do that. Um, so what, what am I to do? And what generally happens is, what I see happening is, people try as best they can, number one, either to emulate that as best they can while they're working, while they're going to school. It, it won't happen. It, it can't be sustained for long. You can't do that. So what generally happens is, after that, people just drop off the face of it. If that's what it takes for me to be athletic, if that's what it takes for me to be healthy, I, I can't do it, I don't need it, I'm gonna have to find some other pursuit, I'll just let it go. But I'm here to tell you that that's not true. You can, 
you can do quite, quite a bit, even though you're not a professional athlete, even though you cannot put that time or dedicate that time into that pursuit. What I'm going to draw up here in just a second is kind of the 30,000 foot view of what I term physical culture. Everybody needs a roadmap, and everybody's roadmap is going to be a little bit different. But everybody's roadmap, the template, is going to look the same. The trick is finding your place on that map to find your place of where you are now and where you want to be and then plan a route of how to get from A to B. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit today, how to do that. You know, how, how do I put that together? How do I even start? We start with a roadmap. Okay? This is what that roadmap looks like. Real quick, first thing we want to look at is health, okay? Health as opposed to performance. And I'll split performance up into aesthetics and sporting performance because those are two totally different, two totally different directions. Health, whenever we, start, whenever we start on a training program, health, and I'll get into what I, what I term health because that's wide ranging. Health winds up looking like this. Once we start training, obviously our health goes up. Then we hit a gray area. Right around in here. That gray area continues on over to another area here, and I'll explain these points here in just a bit. Then a curious thing happens. As we go along, as we continue to train, as we continue to increase intensity, as we continue to increase the time that we're doing this, as we start ramping up, ramping up, ramping up, a curious thing happens to where eventually we fall. Health takes a big time plunge. Let's, let's uh, put on top of that what I'll call performance. It's going to be up to you to determine what performance is, whether we're looking for aesthetics or whether we're looking for sporting performance. And like I say, the two aren't necessarily the same. As we begin to train, our performance, obviously, if we do it right, is going to follow a trajectory that looks like that. Yes, my health has increased, my performance has also increased. Either I'm putting on more muscle mass, or in the case of uh, a 93-year-old client that I had, that means she can get out of, in and out of her car without help. That means she can even drive her frigging car to the club. That means she can fall and get up and not break a hip. So all of this, this whole chart here is going to be determined upon you. It's going to be n equals 1. All of us here were born into this world with certain genetic gifts and limitations as well. The key is to take those gifts and limitations and do the best you can with them so that you can then project a phenotype onto the environment that is the best that it can be. So I don't necessarily compare myself to you, or to you, or to, to you. I compare myself to me the best that I can be. I can look to other people that have the same general genetic predispositions as I do as it, it, it give me an idea of where I can go, but I can't compete against them in that way. So that's the first mindset thing that you have to get in here. This is an internal, an internal challenge, but it's also what makes it a lifelong pursuit. That's why I can have done this for, oh God now, 35 something years, and still every time I go into the gym, every time I touch a weight, I can be jacked about it, okay? Because I'm looking at it from a different point of view. The workout itself is not a, an ends to a, a means to an end, okay? Really, I'm pretty much tapped out as far as what I'm gonna do physically. In fact, right now, I'm probably doing what I can to hang on, but that doesn't matter. I get a lot more out of the workout mentally spiritually even, than just chasing numbers. We'll get into that in a little bit. So performance. As I go along here, my health, and I'll define that here in a minute, is going to kind of do, it's kind of in a gray area here, kind of an unknown area. We know we can maximize health performance pretty quick without a whole lot of time spent in the gym on the track but I can continue this performance curve, and this performance curve will kind of creep, creep, creep. I'm getting better. I'm getting more muscular, better performance, better athletic performance. And then there comes a point out here I'll call C 
where the competitive athlete lives. The competitive athlete lives in this area out here. Old cartographers in the old world, whenever they mapped the end of the known world, at that edge, at the border of that map, they put there be dragons because they didn't know what was out there. They didn't know what, lie, what lay out there. Right here, guys, there be dragons. We don't know. I know I can tune you up like a Ferrari. You can be a high-end, well-oiled machine come competition time, but know this, at that point, when someone is competing, their health is down here and it's getting ready to crumble. You can't stay in this zone for long, no matter what kind of competitive athlete you are. Even bodybuilders out here, you can't stay at competition level for long. Something's going to crack. Something's going to fly apart. Some piece part is going, to, is going to come apart. And I can tell you from personal experience, having been a competitive athlete, my weak link was an ACL and an MCL. Okay? That's what put me back over here. Um, it, it hap it's going to happen if you're a competitive athlete. So training like a competitive athlete is not where we need to go. So performance will come out over here. For the competitive athlete, as long as he wants to compete, let's hope it stays right here, but eventually something's going to fly apart. Let's say it's an ACL or an MCL, and then that goes down as well. Let's define a couple terms here real quick. Health. What is health? And what is health as it relates to performance? Which is an even more interesting question because these things are interlaid just like this. When we talk about health, when I'm talking about health, we have internal and external indicators of health. An internal indicator would be things like uh, inflammatory markers, triglycerides, um, blood pressure, things of this nature. We know as we train, we get somebody who's untrained and start training them, all these indicators start leveling out. Internally, they're much healthier, much healthier. Organ size, organ function even become much better. All of these indicators go right along with their performance. And again, think of this chart as an astrological chart of sorts. Astrolog astrological charts, and I don't want to get too woo-woo here, but here we go. Okay? The template for an astrological chart is the same across the board. What's different about it is when you were born, where you were born, and all these things, that's how that gets filled in. This is going to get filled in in the same way when you come in with your genetic profile. So this is an N equals 1 chart. It's going to be different for everybody. The same template will work for everybody, though. So as we go along, this performance tracks with health to a certain point. Then we kind of get into a gray area. This gray area, now we want to look at the performance curve here, and we want to say, well, how do I define performance? Aesthetics, athletic endeavors. As that goes up, my health really doesn't improve. If you talk to coaches or people more on the fitness end of things, they will tell you that a, that a healthy person, well, what is the definition of health and fitness? The most basic definition is that person's ability to perform a task dependent upon you. That task might be withstanding a fall for an older person. For a younger fit person, a task might be how much power can I produce instantaneously or ho how much power I can produce over a long period of time. If we want to get into kind of a CrossFit definition of it, it would be who can move the most load the furthest in the shortest period of time and will define load, distance, in time. Whoever can do that, and I would also add per pound of body weight, ratio it out that way, I can say is the most fit person. The question then becomes, yes, that person is most fit, but is he most healthy? That way I don't know. Because what it takes to be able to move that load a certain distance in a certain, a certain short period of time may have affected him internally. Now his biomarkers for inflammation may be through the roof. 
Now his cortisol levels may be through the roof. All of these negatively affect health. So can we say he's actually the healthiest person? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe he's genetically gifted. He can withstand that kind of workload and continue to go right on along. Maybe he can't. Maybe he's a ticking time bomb. Yeah, he can move a large load a far distance in a very short period of time, but he's setting himself up some, for a crash here pretty quick. So all of these things have to be in one determined between each of you, each of you out here, everybody doing this has to find their place on this curve. First question is, where do I want to reside? I use myself as an example. Where I want to reside is I want to push the envelope and be right here. I know because I've, I've looked at my blood markers, basic things like blood pressure, VO2 max, things like this, I can say that internally I'm pretty healthy. I'm not over here where I once was performance wise, but you know what? I'm not in danger of blowing out an ACL over here either. Right here I'm doing pretty good. This is where I want to reside. Now the question becomes, how much time per week does it take me to stay there? Okay? I work at a gym. <laughs> okay. I've got the time to put into it. What I'm going to tell you is this. As we go along here, the time requirement increases exponentially. The time it takes for me to hit this point pretty much across the board doesn't take much at all. We're talking 30 minutes a week. If you have the right tools, and I'll get into tools here in just a second. If you have the right tools, we're not talking long at all to get here. At some point in my life, I may very well want to shift over here because I don't have the time. That time payoff, the return on investment on time, to me, at some point, this may not be worth it to put in that kind of time on the track and in the gym. Right now it is. Right now it's cool. You know, it's a good, it's a hobby of mine. I enjoy it. I don't mind putting in the time. At some point, I may want to drift right back here into this A zone to be as healthy as I can be and have a little bit of performance, but that time requirement may be the overriding factor in what I'm looking for. And there have been periods of my life, shorter periods of time, where I have done this. In the corporate world, projects come up. I don't have much time to devote. I know in my mind I'm going to have to drift back over here, but since I've got this whole template in my head, I know where I'm at, I know where I want to get back to, and I have a roadmap. I know how to get back there. So let's talk about, let's talk about phenotypes, the phenotypical expression. Real quick, let's talk about physical culture. What does all this mean? So you come into this world, you're born, like I said, with certain genetic traits, certain, certain markers, certain strengths, certain weaknesses. The key is, and the definition of physical culture, is to take that clay, that genetic lump you've been given, and to optimize the output as it's seen on the environment. That's your phenotype. The whole objective of physical culture is to optimize that phenotype as it's played against the environment. That's the whole goal. And it's an individual goal. If any of you are, are aspiring athletes, all right, this is where you're going to want to be. Come competition time, this is where you're going to want to be. If you are somebody, say, I, I, I kind of uh, joke around and say I'm the trainer to Austin's lawyers, <laughs> the, the attorney community, because these guys and gals, they don't have the luxury of this. But they are type A personalities who want to be as healthy and as fit as they can be with a small investment of time. They're mostly hanging out right here. But they know that, and because I train them, and because we talk about this kind of stuff, they know that they can hover around here, and if they ever wanted to turn up the intensity a little bit, try to push the envelope, yeah, we can get you there, no problem at all. I can definitely get you there. I'm gonna have to have a little bit more time, and we can move you right over here. Is that better for you guys? Everybody see that? Better. Can I go ahead and get rid of this? Everybody kind of get a, got a picture of what, uh, 
what I'm talking about here real quick. So just kind of keep this in your mind because this is going to be the backdrop of everything I'm going to talk about. This is your roadmap. Let's talk about the resources we need. Big resources. Time. Technique. Tools. And the big one, the overriding one, is tenacity. Let's talk about this one first. And all these are interrelated. Let's talk about tenacity first. I would love to stand up here and tell you guys that the pursuit of op optimum physical culture is, is easy. I can tell you it's not. It's, it is definitely not. It is tough. It's hard work. It takes a certain doggedness, determination, stay with itness, ever how you want to define that. Even back there at that low time investment, that time you put in is still, it's hardcore. It's hard stuff. There's no easy way around it. Um, I could make a lot of money by coming up with a new gimmick of saying, you know, this is a new easy way to do that. And in fact, you'll see that every week <laughs> come about. It doesn't happen. It never happens. This is the biggie right here. Because without this, it doesn't matter what you have here. And I can say that if someone comes to me with, with this, it doesn't matter what we have here, I can turn in, I can turn in a, a damn good athlete or someone with good aesthetics. But this is a money breaker right here. You gotta have tenacity, you gotta have doggedness. You gotta have a desire to do this. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. Technique and tools. So as you go along and you kinda look on the internet, you read magazines, you, uh, you look at the different protocols that people champion. All of these different protocols I would call techniques. The thing about techniques is they all work. They all work for some people some of the time. For the guy who develops a certain technique, obviously it works for him that he came up with it. It works well for him. Will it work for, well for you? I don't know. You're not him. You don't have his same genetic makeup. You're not playing against the same environment that he's playing against. You don't have the same hormonal milieu that he does or she does. All of these things, all of these things must be taken into account. So to say that one program, one technique, one way of doing things, uh, Bill Starr's 5x5 five five technique, fantastic program, will it work for everyone? No. Will it work for a lot of people? Yeah, pretty much. That's a great place to start. In fact, a lot of kids I coach, I mean, that's, that's the go-to thing, five by five. And just keep throwing weight on the bar and roll on until you stall. Then you stall, then we'll talk about something else. But you cannot latch on to a technique and think that it's going to be the golden bullet because it won't be. It's not going to be for you unless you just get extremely lucky. You roll, you roll craps first time out, bam, you happen to land on the right technique that works for you. God love you, man, roll on. But I'm gonna tell you, most of you are not gonna be that lucky. Most of you are gonna flounder around searching for the perfect technique and it's not gonna be there. What it is what, and what it takes, we gotta drop back down here to tenacity and you have to mentally look at this technique and figure out if it will work for you. Try it for a while, see if it will. Some, some techniques you can look at and obviously, no, that's not gonna work for me. That comes to knowing yourself, that comes to operating out of your base camp, and I'll get to operating out of your base camp here in just a second, but just know that for the purposes of right now, a technique is just that. It's a technique that we might use at a certain point. Some aspects of that technique I might incorporate into my own program. Will I use the entire technique? No, I don't use anybody's entire 
entire technique program. I take bits, pieces, and parts, put it together to form what works for me. Tools. I'm lucky enough at Efficient Exercise where I have some very, very unique tools that allow me to severely reduce time requirements spent in the gym. We'll look at one of those tools tomorrow, the, uh, the ARX, ARX equipment. But again, it's only a tool. All it is, if you want to use a carpenter analogy, all right, I've just got a super duper, super duper uh, saw in my kit. That's all it is. If you're not lucky enough to live in Austin, come train with us. Hey, it doesn't matter. I can do the same thing with a rusty barbell and dumbbell. It's just going to take a little bit longer time. That's, and that's all the difference is. Yes, I can, I can really, I can uh, use much more advanced techniques if I have the proper tools. But that shouldn't limit me as far as my expression of my phenotype. That comes into my environment. If I've got the tools, great. If I don't, I'm going to just keep right on rolling, do the best I can with what I got. You know, my wife is a chef, and what's interesting about that is to see, when we're talking about technique, if anybody's seen a good chef operate, they have a recipe. She'll kind of glance at that recipe, set it aside, and then she rolls. All it is is a blueprint. All it is is a little bit of a road map to tell her how to get to A and B. Okay? A good chef will produce a fantastic meal, not by following that roadmap, not by following the techniques per se, but by being able to ad lib and knowing what that meal requires at this altitude, at this temperature, all these other, all these other things that play into this. If she went just by the recipe, it'd be all right, but it wouldn't be spectacular like most of her stuff is. The same way you need to be about physical culture. You need to look at these different techniques take the bits and pieces of them that are fantastic and that work for you under your circumstance and cobble together good program and roll on. <laughs> then we come to time. Everybody's bugaboo. Again, remember how this chart was set up down here. Fact of the matter is, if you want to pursue goals that are over at the right end of that chart, you're going to have to put in a little bit more time. Whether that means you're looking for bodybuilding pursuits, and that means you're spending time particularly in the gym, or if you're more on the sporting side of things, maybe it's a combination of gym time and uh, outside practice time. If you're a cyclist, that means time in the saddle. Now we can do different techniques to reduce that time in the saddle, one of which increasing your strength. And we can train in the saddle differently where we do uh, higher intensity intervals as opposed to just logging miles. But that doesn't change the fact that I'm going to have a big time requirement if I want to pursue those goals. Anybody have any questions right now before I, before I go on, before I lose anybody here? Because I don't want to lose anybody because all this kind of builds. It builds on itself. Yeah, what's the five by five? Five by five. It's, it's simply uh, five sets of five reps of a particular exercise. It's, it's more of a linear progression if you're familiar with this. Um, so every time I come into the gym or every so often I'm adding so many pounds to the bar in a particular lift which works great starting out. The problem with linear, and I'll get this in whenever I set up, uh, whenever we talk about auto regulation here in just a second. It works great for a while. The problem is you can't continue to do that forever. Obviously, everybody would be a, ch a champion power lifter. I mean, you just can't do it. So what are you going to do now? Okay, you've tapped out on squats or deadlifts. Say, now what are you going to do? Five by five's played out. <laughs> you got to go somewhere after that. But yeah, basically it's five sets of five repetitions at a certain weight, linear progression as we go along. 
say every week we're going to add five pounds to the bar, whatever that might be, and we're going to keep rolling on, keep hitting that, keep hitting that, keep hitting that. Base camp. Again, everybody comes in with uh, certain genetic traits. One problem when we look at certain, uh, certain techniques, certain programs, weightlifting programs, is the impression that you're given is it works across the board. Again, that's, it, it's simply not true, not true at all. One quick aside, I don't know if you guys remember back in um, uh, maybe the early 90s, Bill Phillips, who had uh, Muscle Media 2000 magazine, he ran a contest there for a few years, and I cannot remember the name of the contest. It was Body something. Body for Life. Body for Life. There you go. Thanks. Um, and not to hate on Bill at all. I mean, he's a fantastic marketer. But here's the thing. He ran this contest. The impression that you were given, if you followed along in the magazine, was he ran it in a contest style. So whoever, whoever uh, was a, had the best looking physique so long, so, you know, and it kind of whittled down from the top, I don't know what it was, 50. Then it whittled down to the top 30, and it, you know, it kind of kept going progressively. But the impression that's given by doing that is that everybody across the board is making progress, and these are just the top 50. In fact, they might have been the only 50 that got any benefit whatsoever out of it. But the impression was given because you see these, you see these people, you didn't see the fall off. You didn't see the thousands of people who took a before and after picture and you're like, huh? <laughs> it's no change at all. I don't see any change. So my point is, is not to slam on, on Bill for a fantastic uh, uh, marketing uh, device, it, and it was. It was a great marketing device. But I only bring this up uh, to point out to you that none of these programs work for everybody. And you have to be very cognizant of that. And don't go into it thinking that they are. Go, you can go into these things with an open mind and think I'm going to try it out if it looks like it might work given my, my uh, genetic predisposition. But don't go into it think, it, and don't go into it thinking um, or don't uh, be totally discouraged if it doesn't work for you. So going along base camp, if I have a guy, you know, just pick on Patrick real quick, okay? Obviously more, more of an endurance type of guy, okay? In good shape, fantastic shape, more slender build. Is there any way, with, in any way, would I put him through a powerlifting program? It would wreck him. It would totally wreck him. It would destroy his, his sporting performance. I mean, it's just a no-brainer. That is not his base camp. His base camp is an endurance, in endurance events. He knows that he can use certain strength techniques to enhance those endurance events, but if he were to train like a power lifter, it, it would ruin him. He knows this intuitively. I know this intuitively. You guys need to find your base camp and know where your strengths are intuitively and go out and find programs that will enhance that. Some guys are fantastic power lifters. Some guys are built that way. Some guys are very sturdy, short. Um, they have the, the uh, genetic predisposition to be power lifters. They don't need to be doing the Vince Garanda um, German volume training 10 by 10. Why? They're not getting anything out of it, or they're not getting much out of it. Their base camp is low repetition, high weights. That is their base camp. My reason for bringing this up is we want to operate from a base camp. So again, just real quick, performance, health, competitive. Their base camp is going to be, say, powerlifting right here. But the thing is, they do need to splinter out from that, go in different directions in an applied way. So as sometimes, yes, they are doing more high repetition work. Sometimes they are doing very explosive, more athletic 
work. But they know where their base camp is. This is the, this is the route of where their workouts are gonna take place. So again, on this map, each and every one of you, if you're looking to, to perfect your, uh, your phenotypical expression into the environment, you need to figure out what your base camp is. What do you operate best? For example, I know in myself, real quick, if we look at uh, velocity, force, some of you may know this curve. Force velocity curve, right? Really, really high speeds. I perform an action at a really, really high speed, say a bench press at a high speed. I can't produce a lot of force. It's just not there. Other side of the coin, very, very high force production. That bar's not moving very fast. It can't. It's physiological, physiological property. Power production. Template on top of that looks something like this. My highest power production right in here. Some of you, well, let me say this, all of you, your strength is going to be somewhere in here. Some of you are going to be better over here, the power lifter type. Some of you are going to be better over here. High, high, high technique, rapid, rapid movement. Um, um, golfers, baseball players, all right? They might not produce a whole lot of force. They don't need to, right? They're operating over here. I just happen to know through my training, my best point is somewhere right in here. My base camp sits right up in here. My ability to produce repeat intense power in the one to three repetition range, short duration, I know that's my base camp. That's what I excel at. I operate over here for long, I get crushed. I do a powerlifting routine. If I do a powerlifting type workout, very high intensity, high force production, low, low velocity, I'm friggin' crushed. And, and I know it. But I do need to venture out here every now and again to be a better athlete on the other side. I just can't operate here for long. This is my base camp. Most of my workouts take place right here. High power production, very, very quick. Bam, bam, bam. I can do this all day long, repeats. I get a lot out of it. But to be able to enhance this, I still need to be able to produce a lot of force, and I still need to be able to produce very, very ballistic movements. But these are augments to my base camp, which sits right here. All of you guys have a certain base camp. You might not know it yet, but you do. You might not have found it yet, but you will if you keep looking for it. It's somewhere along this line somewhere along this power curve somewhere somewhere here is where your base camp is if you find that base camp then you can find techniques that will naturally play to that base camp's strong suit once you know that once you hone in on that base camp then you can start making forays out from that to enhance to enhance your overall health and fitness any questions there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, wait for the mic. Just my question is, uh, you might be just about to go into this, so if you are, just tell me. Sure. Um, my question is, what um, what about the techniques? What do you what do you look for that um, is skewed towards one or the other, and how do you how do you find, how do you look for it? Out. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you can do a simple thing like look in the mirror. Number one, right? Tall, skinny guy. All right. He's not going to be a power lifter per se. Okay. We're talking more endurance type. Well, not, okay. so, so not where your base camp is, but as far as like, let's, so let's say I, I know, you know, I'm a tall, skinny guy. I'm skewed towards one, sure. one way. Yeah. Um, how do I know what tech, what techniques? Oh, how do you know uh, what techniques yeah. to use? Okay. So let's say, let's say we have a more endurance type person whose who's base camp 
is more of a high repetition type of thing, right? Because just his joint structure, he can't handle a whole lot of weight bearing high force stuff. It will wreck, wreck him, kind of like me, okay? I just can't handle that for long because it just tears my joints up. Not only that, it tears my central nervous system up. So if I know that, I can play, I can play to that strength. Someone with a small joint structure, someone with uh, yeah, more of an ectomorph build. Okay, I, I, now I'm starting to gravitate away from this area, more back over here. And the opposite side, in the opposite side of the coin. So I have somebody with very, very robust joints, very stocky, that type of build. And I'm just talking very, very general here. I mean, it, it, as you go along, you continually refine, continually refine, continually refine. I'm still refining. I still have to check myself here. You know, am I still this athlete? Is this still where my, my golden zone is? I mean, it's a daily, it's a daily check. And it, and it always has been. Because I do fluctuate back and forth here. Yeah, I still get crushed over here. I work out with some guys. This is where they live. That is their base camp. Work out with them, yeah, murder. Move them over here, they're murdered over here. So it's a continual process, a continual fuel out process, which was another great thing about this endeavor. You're never at the end, never. That's a fantastic, I mean, you're never at the end. You're always learning new things about yourself. All right, so I was going to ask, how do you determine your base camp? But sure. It sounds to me like what you're saying is uh, it's just kind of learn as you go, trial and error. you just got to try it It out is. And I mean, you've got, it, and it's totally, it's totally trial and error, but you have certain clues along the way. It's not a total just fishing expedition. You have certain clues along the way. Okay? But it's, a t but it's always being refined. It's always being refined. And I guess, um, sure. Um, so are there any resources for, uh, let's say, smaller, um, small boned, I guess, ectomorphs? Sure, yeah. Is there like, um, are there sites on online where they kind of say, okay, these are the ideal, um, I guess, base camps for you? Is there like a kind of generic plan of action or is it all just? No, no, there's really no generic plan. And that's another thing, there's really no generic plan of action here. And I guess that's what my overriding message is. It can't be, you know, there can't be a genetic plan. You guys have to go along, have a vision, chase that vision. But along the way, you can have that roadmap like I drew up at the first. You have an indication of where you want to be on that health performance spectrum, where you want to fall along there. For instance, an ectomorph, bam, right now I know that I can't handle a whole lot of weight. I can't operate over here for long. My joints can't support it. So me looking at Louis Simmons powerlifting conjugate system, that, it's not going to work for me. No, right, right. Right? Okay, so, okay, so there I have one clue. That's, <laughs> that's not going to work for me. So then I have to start going along. Well, well let me kind of look around. And although I don't want to, to say precisely emulate what this person does who might be built similarly to me, but at least I've got some clues. He's found a similar path that's worked for him. I can take some of these clues and now I can start bringing them over and trying them out myself. But the thing is, I'm not married to exactly what he's doing. I have to keep in my mind that's worked for him, for him. Even though he might have the same structure as me, he's got a different hormonal profile probably. Um, he's in a different environment. He's able to devote a lot more time to that pursuit than what I do. So I can take some clues for him from him and run along with it, but I can't be married to his particular program and I have to be open-minded enough to be able to shift gears on my own and kind of learn this process and, and, and go along from there. But that's kind of how you get started doing it. Yeah, the reason I asked it is it's because there's a lot of information online. I mean, it's just everybody's oh, trying ton. to sell you something. And so I guess our own roadmap is like our filter, you know, for what we want to achieve. You just kind of like, it uh, is. You just, is it like intuitive? You kind of know, I guess, when you. It is intuitive in a lot you, of ways. Okay. 
It is an intuitive process. It's, it's a self-learning process just like, just like any other pursuit. It's just a physical self-learning process. But just, you know, you just know that there is no, there's no silver bullet out there, okay? I can take, I, I train in this area, that's my base camp, okay? And I look at athletes who train this way, it just so happens this is more of a track and field application. So I can look at athletes who are uh, 100 meter sprinters, who are uh, shot putters, disc, discus type athletes. That just kind of happens to be where I fall in right there. I can look at those type of workouts and see what those guys are doing. I can take clues from these type of workouts and cobble together my own workout program, okay? But I'm not competing here. I'm not a competitive discus thrower. I'm not a competitive javelin thrower. I'm not a competitive sprinter. But I know my genetic predisposition kind of pushes me in that direction. So I can take clues from that type of, from that type of athlete. From that, then I cobble together my own workout program. And so, the, and so in your case, you would look around and kind of try to find either athlete, physique type person who kind of fits your same mold, start getting clues there, apply those, given your, your circumstance, your time, the tools you have, the techniques you're able to employ, and then you start from there and you start gradually coming up. And just realize it's a never ending process. And that's the biggest thing to get across to you. This isn't, if, if you think you're getting into this game and you say, when I get to be 250 pounds and can bench press, you know, 400 or whatever, it's never gonna be there because if you do get there, you're not gonna be satisfied. There's always 405, there's always 415, there's always 260, there's a, you know, you're never gonna be satisfied. In a lot of ways, that's fantastic. I mean, that's what life is all about, is, is continual strive. But if you're getting into this as a means to hit that, you'll never stay in the game for long. There's got to be much more, it's got to be more of a, almost a spiritual pursuit and a self-betterment pursuit, and that's just the tool. The lifting, the working out is just a tool. It's a meditation is what it boils down to. It's a meditation using physical culture as a tool. If you can get to that point, you'll stay in the game forever. And you will naturally then gravitate towards these things that make you better because you've been in the game for so long. Now you know, now you start gravitating. You, you're building a bigger toolbox. You take another step, bigger toolbox, another step, bigger toolbox, better techniques as you come along. Let me talk real quick because I think I'm probably getting near out of time. Let me talk about one technique that I like to use real quick. Something that just about anybody can employ. All right? Let's talk about auto-regulation real quick. It's a very easy technique to employ. So the gentleman here asked a while ago about, uh, just for instance, Bill Starr's 5 by 5 program, okay? The difference between a linear periodization program and an auto-regulatory program is this. Linear periodization says that as I go along in time for a particular exercise, Let's just say deadlift, just pick one. As I go along in time, I should be able to plot, as I go along, my weight increase for that particular lift. As I go along week to week to week, throughout the different mesocycles of a program, I should be able to know 10 pounds, bam, bam, here, another 10. I'm going right along, going right on up. That's linear periodization. To some extent, to some extent, linear periodization does work. It works for people who are just frank beginners right out of the gate. It works for those people because pretty much everything works for those people. You can push your car in a driveway, it doesn't matter. You're going to get stronger and better. And it works for athletes who are very, very, very dedicated and their life is driven towards that end of pushing a big weight. 
of excelling on, in track and field. That, that is who that works for. For most people, that is not going to work. You don't have the time to dedicate towards that. You don't have the time to program. You've got a life, right? You go into school, you got a job. You just don't have the time to dedicate to a linear periodization program. So to say linear periodization doesn't work is not what I'm saying. It does work for a select few people. I would venture to say that most of you in here, well, if you're here, you're not a professional athlete. So, I mean, if you're here listening to me, you're not a professional athlete. You've got, you've got a coaching staff, right? So auto-regulation auto overcomes that problem. Let's talk about what things can derail you from using linear periodization. What kind of things can come into your life that would disrupt that bam, bam, bam pattern? Anything, any kind of stress, any kind of job stress, any kind of relationship stress, um, money stresses, you name it. The body senses stress as stress. It doesn't matter if it comes psychological. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's, if it's physical. Stress is stress. If I come into the gym, on a day where I'm supposed to deadlift 450 because that's what my linear periodization program calls for and I can't do it, what then? I can't budge 450 off the ground. I'm supposed to be able to pop it right on and off. What do I do then? Well, linear periodization is very Soviet style, very bam, 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 bam. Well, I don't know. I, I couldn't get it off the ground. What am I going to do? That's where people stall throw linear periodization to the side and either quit lifting or jump on to the next, whatever the next program is, they latch on to and they just sit there and chase their tails. Let me tell you a way to get around that real easy. And I still use this to this day, still. I've used it for a long, long, long time. I still use it, auto-regulation. Let's pick that deadlift example again. Let's say that I'm just going to uh, use a round number here so it's easy. I went to Texas State, right? So I can't use, my math skills are a little lacking. 400 pounds, okay? 400 pounds, we'll just say six reps. Knowing my base camp, knowing where I'm, where I'm at, my base camp, I know that for strength applications, I'm better off operating in this six rep range, okay? Just for starters. You don't need to get this deep into this, but I'm just, just explaining why I use six reps. Six reps is a good strength building program for me because of my genetic predisposition. Going any lower than that, if I do it too often, I get crushed. If I stay around six, seven, eight repetitions with a pretty heavy weight, with a, with a slower tempo, more of a force production tempo. Okay, I'm all right, I can operate there. Let's say that last time I did deadlifts, I was able to hit 400 pounds for six reps. Now I'm coming along, I wanna hit another deadlift day here, okay? Say we're into the next week, I wanna go deadlift. Linear periodization, if I go back to that, say 410, I was supposed to hit 410. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say I did 400 pounds for six reps last time I did it. My goal is going to be increase reps with that same weight. Here's how I'm going to go about doing that. First off, I'm going to lead in. We're going to have about four or five different sets here. And you can do this. You can do this with any, with any exercise. It's better to do it with a compound exercise, okay? If we're just talking barbells and dumbbells, okay? Which everybody, I'm assuming everybody has access to, uh, to barbells and dumbbells. It's pretty much ubiquitous. That's why I kind of picked the deadlift here. This can be done on machines. It can be done on any, any apparatus. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead in at 50% of my weight. I'm going to come in at 200 pounds. And I'm going to hit 12 reps with it. Second set, I'm going to take 75% of that. I'm going to do six reps with it, okay? So what I've got going on here is 
a little bit of a warm up. This is no different really than a five by five program with a little different spin on it. Third repetition, or third set, I'm gonna come up here. Now I'm at 400 pounds. Now this is a money set. I'm gonna go all out. How many repetitions can I get at 400 pounds? If I'm feeling good, if my stress is well, okay, got low stress, everything's going well, hopefully I'll beat 400 pounds. Let's say I get eight reps as an example. I beat my last time out. I'm gonna come down here. I've got two money sets, okay? So I'm gonna come down for another, another crack at 400, but now I'm gonna jack the weight up a little bit. And this is where being chef of the gym comes into play. How much weight am I gonna to add to it? How did I feel when I did that last round? I got eight repetitions, but was it an ugly eight or was it a good solid eight? All these things I have to consider, I have to take into account. Let's say I felt pretty good. Yeah, that eight came up pretty easy. I'm gonna jack this up, 420, and again, I'm gonna see what I get out of it. Let's say I got five repetitions with 420. This weight is now gonna carry forward to the next time I do a deadlift, okay? Now I start this cycle all over again. But instead of, instead of uh, six reps, it'll be 420 for five. And I start this cycle all over again. And I continue on. Two things about this. I'll probably do another set, maybe a knockdown set, we call it. I'll knock down the weight, maybe do a higher repetition set here. If I'm feeling really, really, really good, if I knocked out 420 for five and said, damn, man, I'm feeling super strong here, 430. Okay, let's give that a shot. Let's see what we got there. So this is kind of a feel out process. A couple things about this. Number one, I go into this with the mentality that if I don't do well here on that first money set, I cut myself a break. It's not the end of the world. It's no big deal. As long as I bring every bit of intensity that I had when I walked into the gym that day, as long as I bring that tenacity from back of those first, the four, four things we talked about earlier, if I bring that tenacity and doggedness in here and I just didn't get six repetitions, I gave it my all that day. It's a totally different mindset than linear periodization. I know I gave it my all, whatever. That is still my maximum right there. Next time it comes up, we'll try it again. What will happen, what always happens with this is progression after you get out of being a rank amateur or uh, very, very new to the weightlifting game, what you'll find is progress doesn't come in steps. Progress comes in one big step. So what happens is I might sit there at 400 pounds and I might just kind of hover at 400 pounds for quite a long time. I'll go one day, I might get seven repetitions with it. Next time out, I might get five. And I'll just sit there hovering around, hovering around, hovering around. One day I'll come in and it may be a day that I feel like you know, hey, I probably don't have it today, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it, the old, uh, give it the old college try. We'll see where we're at. Bam, 430 comes off the ground like nothing. You cannot predict when this progress is gonna happen. You just can't do it. That's the breakdown of linear progression, the other breakdown of it. You can't predict when these things are gonna happen. I've been in this game 35 plus years. I can't predict when I'm gonna have a good day, really. It surprises the hell out of me sometimes when I come into a gym and I better my progress on a certain lift. I'm like, you know, I traveled all night, but you know, I'm feeling like crap, yada, yada, yada. You go through a list of excuses, come in and, and 
the weight comes off the ground. I, I can't explain it. But what auto regulation allows you to do, it allows you to keep the table set and the door open for opportunity. And that's exactly what you want to do every time you go into the gym. I set the table, I keep the door open. Whenever oper that opportunity, and I don't know when it's going to be. I can't predict that. If I could, I'd, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in Vegas. <laughs> you know what I mean? If anybody can predict that with any accuracy, it, it just can't be done. Keeping the table set and the door open for that opportunity, that's what auto-regulation is all about. And that's, that's why I use it as the basis of my workouts. I don't use it all the time. I don't use it for every exercise. But it forms the basis of my workouts. And, it's, and it's, easy to, it's easy to track, too, which is another thing. When you've got all these other, all these other time requirements, all these other uh, pressures on you, and you want to try to squeeze, squeeze a workout in, I know I can go to my workout log. I can pull out that deadlift. I can see what I've got there. Bam, and I can roll with it. I know what weight I ought to be hitting. I've got a repetition scheme, and I'm off to the races. No worries about linear periodization, no calculations to have to worry about, no mental anguish if I didn't hit my projected weight, and I can continue on forever. This is a never-ending thing. So as I go along throughout, throughout a uh, training year, certain exercises naturally come into my wheelhouse and then leave my wheelhouse too. For instance, during the during the spring, summer, and fall, I'm either on the track sprinting or I'm uh, riding a bike quite a bit. And to take one exercise for an example, when I'm doing those things, I don't squat. I don't squat during that time period because it just trashes my sprint, trashes my cycling ability. Um, but when the fall comes, in the winter, and I'm not out so much, then I can bring that particular exercise back into, the, uh, back into the mix. I look back at my logs, I see where I was squatting last fall, that puts me in the ballpark, and here I am auto-regulating again, bam, right from that, this is like I never missed. Obviously, I'm not gonna be as strong, I haven't squatted in a while, but that gives me a good ballpark indication of where to, where to jump back in the game, and then I'm right back running. Right back running with it. Any questions about auto regulation? How to how you can incorporate that into your? So your max weight can change with breaks and periods of time. Sure, what, absolutely. What happens, like, you know, if you're not hitting 400 for a month, do you then stay retest with it. and go. You stay no, with stay it. Stay with it. Yeah. But if you but take like a six month break or something or a season. What'll happen? For for instance, let's say let's say that a squat. We'll use that as an example. If I haven't squatted in, in whatever, eight months, and it's, seriously, there's sometimes I'll go eight months without hitting a squat. I'll flip back through my workout log. Now I've got to wait, let's go with that same 400 pounds. I know <laughs> that's not gonna happen. I haven't touched, I haven't done this. What technique, you know, I did eight months away from a certain technique. You know, I'm not gonna be able to do it well, but it gets me in the ballpark. And two, I'm not wigged out by it. Oh my God, I didn't hit 400 pounds in the squat. You just, you know, I let that go. It'll be there, and I know it'll come back. But it gets me in the ballpark. It saves me from coming into the gym going, I want to squat today, where do I start? You know, I don't need, you know, messing around with 225 and just kind of doing that whole buildup period. I can jump right to it. All right, 400, 400 pounds, seven repetitions, let's go. So 400 on the bar, I might get two, I might get three. But. I'm still in the ballpark, and I know where to go from there. Now, this is where the chef part comes in, right? Because that is the recipe. Now let's call the chef part into it. 400 pounds, seven repetitions, I know that's not going to happen. It's not going to go. When I knock it down to 375, okay, I'm still in the ballpark. 375 is probably a little bit more manageable. Then we'll shoot for six. Okay, then I'll go from there. That's where being, we're abiding strictly by the recipe or being the chef. That's where a little bit of time under the bar comes in. 
let's say you don't have any time under the bar, none. You're not prepared. I can kind of make that call because, you know, I've been in the game for a while. I kind of know where to go with this. If you don't, if you haven't, you stick with 400 and you roll on, bam, auto-regulate it. And the thing is, if you don't have a whole lot of time under the bar, the chances of you falling off much of that max, you're not going to be far away from it. And if you are down from it, it's going to take you long to get back to it. Okay, so this might be a two-part question. Sure. So, um, okay, so part of the auto regulation talked about changing the weights or yep. uh, for one way to adapt. Uh, would another way, if you're, well, for lack of a better word, plateauing, sure, uh, would be to like change the technique. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank. Good okay, segue into the next Thanks. portion here. Okay. So, what are some things we can change? Okay, changing technique is one thing. Changing exercises, always fantastic. My overall workout program, and what I in in. What I give my clients a lot of times is a little bit different than what I give myself. Because again, every client is an individual. Every, I treat every client as an N equals one, a study of one, okay? When we are, when I'm talking about changing techniques, I'm constantly rolling in exercises as I go along and rolling out exercises once I think they're tapped out. If I go along in an auto-regulation way, let's just, again, go back to deadlifts. If I go on for a long period of time, and deadlifts is a constant throughout my routine, and I'm not, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of change here, I will, let that, I will let that particular exercise slide out for a while, and I'll go on to a different exercise that might be similar to a deadlift, but not exactly, not exactly a deadlift. So I might then jump to good mornings, say, for instance. Similar exercises work as, works a similar structure, but it's not, not exactly the same, and I'll hit on that for a while. Again, that's part of being a chef and knowing not, you know, when to quit beating a dead horse. Okay, now I can say, keep the table set, leave the door open for opportunity, but if opportunity <laughs> doesn't come in after eight months, you know, I need to kind of rethink things here. I need to shift focus. And a lot of times, that's what it takes. So I go along for a while. If I don't see any good, if I don't see any good increase, I'll shift that exercise out, go to a different, similar exercise. I'll come back to my old mainstay, the deadlift. And a lot of times, that's what it takes to, to bump me back up and get me going again. So like I say, just as if you were reading something on the internet in a magazine, don't take what I say is it's got to be this way. So you've got to be able to play in the gym and be intuitive. Use these as techniques, but, but I'm telling you now, you're going to have to put your own personal spin on everything I say. Everything. Let's talk real quick about, since you brought up changes in technique, let's talk about tempo real quick. And tempo is something that, that people really don't look at when they're talking about weight training. And it's very, very important. Tempo. Let's look at how tempo is written first. Just use this for an example. When we talk about when we talk about lifting a weight and you break it down, what exactly what exactly is going on? Take a bench press real quick for an example. There's a lowering eccentric phase. There's a pause at the bottom. There's a concentric move to the top. There's another pause, and again, going back into the lowering. When you think about this, when you think about that, there's a hell of an opportunity for change just in that one simple movement. That one simple movement, a bench press, can be changed to be a totally different exercise. It can affect you totally differently. Remember, again, Velocity, right? Force. Power. Look something like that. I can change this exercise 
just a normal bench press, one exercise, I can make fit anywhere, anywhere throughout this curve by changing tempo and by changing load accordingly. One simple exercise and I can float or I can surf anywhere along this curve. And in fact, I will tell you is you need to change tempo. You need to float throughout this curve, to surf this curve up and down to get full benefit from working out. To, to stay in one spot, remember we talked about base camp. My base camp is here, but if I were to only work out in this zone, I wouldn't get it, I would never get any better. I have to, I have to be able to fluctuate side to side. I do that by changing tempo. First number, tempo, this is the eccentric or the lowering portion of the exercise. These are seconds. What this represents right here is a lowering, a three second, thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, pause at the bottom, explode on the way up, one second pause, then I'm right back into the, right back into the three second negative. So when I'm writing in my, in my, my workout journal, I don't just put bench press, for instance. I put bench press, I've got my load, my parameter. If I'm auto-regulating, I've got that. But I also put tempo but because tempo tells me where I'm at along this curve. Between tempo and load, I know where I'm sitting on this curve. I can change this simple bench press and make it a ballistic bench press by dropping this to fast as possible or one or whatever. So now quick, explode right back up. Now I've changed this from being over here somewhere. Now we're talking a bench press that's lying over here somewhere. Now it's a much more ballistic exercise. Totally changes the exercise. Totally changes the physiological um, result from the exercise. So when you talk about changing techniques, don't just think about changing exercises, but changing tempo as well. And tempo can be changed on any exercise, whether it's a machine-based exercise, whether we're talking Nautilus machine, um, whether we're talking uh, barbells, dumbbells, whatever, in any exercise, too. It totally changes, um, like I say, it totally changes where you reside on this curve. So I can, change, I can change this tempo, and I can ride this tempo for a while, again, auto-regulating it under this tempo, and now I've got a whole other set of parameters that I can change. So there's a lot of overlay. Let's, let's say you were, let's say your normal auto-regulating, let's say you're bench pressing, and the normal tempo, and what I, what I say, everybody's normal tempo, the perfect repetition for people just starting out. This is why I always tell everybody, and this works, this works across the board. The perfect tempo is this. 3, O, oh, X, 1. A three second negative. Nice and controlled, three second negative. No pause, explode fast as possible on the way up. Pause a second, right back into the three second negative. This is, that's money right there. That's perfect. That's a perfect place to start. Your initial auto regulation should start with that tempo. Now, as I go along, say I have deadlift, or let's, let's go back to bench press just for sake of argument. Bench press under that tempo, auto regulated, and then I roll on. I can have a totally different, different portion of the, the uh, velocity force curve, and it's a different exercise. This could be bench press one, 
Now I can go to a ballistic bench press. That's a whole other thing. That's a whole other exercise. It affects you totally different. It affects you physio physiolog physiologically different. And the thing about that is, as you float up and down that velocity force curve, as you hit these different points, they all play onto one another. My ability to do a ballistic bench press affects positively my ability to do a bench press under this tempo. My ability to bench press under this tempo allows me to do a ballistic bench press with more weight. They play on one another if you do it right. So, getting back to my base camp, where's my base camp? It's this kind of stuff here, ballistic stuff. Fast, high power production, okay? That's my base camp. I come out of my base camp to hit a bench press under this tempo. I'm not as good at it. I'm just not genetically predisposed to be good at it. But I do it now and again because it makes me better in my base camp. This is another way of saying, and to make it very basic, don't get in a rut. <laughs> Ruts kill in whatever, and especially in physical culture, ruts kill. You have, to be, you have to be pliable and to be able to move, and especially up and down that velocity force curve, to be able to pick different programs and exercises up and down that curve to enhance your abilities. Anybody else more specific questions maybe about this? So this is just kind of a big umbrella overview. Anybody have more specific questions? That just a question just about that. Um, would, is that generally the, like you said, with the, uh, if you're doing an exercise for eight months, you're not seeing results, you change, sure. you do change the tempo. Yeah. Is that generally the first kind of, uh, the first tempo change you'd recommend from the 3 x one to going to ballistic if you're stuck in a rut before you let the exercise Yeah, and go. It, it doesn't have to be as drastic as what I showed there. I mean, you can do little tempo changes as well. Um, you can do things like, like jack up the eccentric, okay? So I can, I can move this all the way up to eight seconds. Now we're talking, you know, big time negatives. So I'll go through a series of negatives sometimes. Let's call this eight. Would Make you it recommend doing that negative. It totally changes the exercise again. Okay. You know? Would you recommend doing that with a deadlift specifically? No. That now, that's why I changed the example to bench press because a deadlift is a different animal. I didn't even okay. I didn't even want to go down that road. So Okay. okay. So that's <laughs> but, yeah, ne stuff. negative deadlifts are not uh, that, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. That's why I changed it to bench press. I want to get away from that. Pretty much a deadlift, you're ripping it off the ground as hard and as fast as you can and it, it, that pretty much doesn't change. Now, it may not come off the ground fast, but the attempt should be there to blast it off the ground as fast as possible. And this, as fast as possible, what that X denotes, and I will say too, that's, that's the intent to move the bar as fast as possible, not necessarily that it is moving fast as possible, but the intent is there to push it as fast as possible. Pretty much that, for me, stays the same. All of my concentric movements are as fast as I can humanly produce. Now they might not move fast depending on the, depending on the exercise and the load that I'm using. And that's the same across the board. It's the same with a barbell dumbbell. It's the same with our uh, ARX equipment. And it would be the same on a Nautilus machine, which I know not a lot of uh, Nautilus people are probably cringing right now, oh my God, but that, that's just how I do it. Um, and I know that just from personal experience, it works for me. It's not gonna work for everybody, but that's, that's how I do it and that's how I've found that it works for me. We got one right yeah, here, yeah. Got the mic ready. Um, I have two questions. Sure. Um, I know everybody's different, but yep. generally speaking, uh, how often do you want to be lifting weights per week? Ah, the golden question. Um, it depends. <laughs> and that's not a cop-out answer. 
It depends on, number one, what tools do you have available to you. It depends on the type of workouts that you're performing every time you're in the gym. Um, and it depends on what kind of time you have. It, it, let me just take you through my training week. Just, and there's no typical training week, but I'll, just as an example, just as an, an example to, to show you what I'm talking about. Let's just say I come in on Monday, I don't have a whole lot of time, okay? I've got 15, 20 minutes. Bam, in my head, I'm thinking 15, 20 minutes, I want a, this is gonna be a classic high intensity workout. A workout like you might, you might have heard uh, other speakers here talk about high intensity training, but okay, I've only got that much time, bam, I'm hitting a high intensity workout, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it takes. The next day, I might have plenty of time. Plenty of time being, let's say I have two hours. Well, if I have that kind of time, I know that I can do Olympic derivative lifts, power clean, snatches, that kind of thing. Now I've got the time to recover. The thing about those type of exercises is you just can't hit them, hit them, hit them, hit them. There's a fatigue factor in there that, that has to be accounted for. They're fantastic exercises. I love them. But if I'm looking for a, a time intensive work, that's not going to be it. It can't be. I can't get the amount of work I need out of those type of exercises in that short period of time. So if I have a long period of time like that, I'm thinking in my mind, sprints, tire flips, you know, outside kind of conditioning stuff, uh, GPP type stuff, or I'm thinking Olympic derivative lifts where I do one, two, maybe three repetitions, bam, the bar's down, I'm back resting for four or five minutes because it's such a central nervous system hit, you just can't jump back into the, to the next one without losing technique. Another thing I might do, and I do this too because I'm constantly rotating different, uh, different techniques, is I might throw in a bodybuilding type workout throughout the week too. And that might be a 10 by 10, eight by eight. Okay, now we're talking classic bodybuilding stuff but that takes time as well. Another consideration too is what plane of motion are we looking at? Okay, if I, just, if I just did a vertical push and pull, so if I did say overhead presses and pull ups, okay, I have to take that into account when I'm planning my next workout. All this is just cumulative, bam, 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 on top of things, so it's a constant juggle. That means no two weeks are the same, that means no two workouts are the same, and it's just a constant fold over, constant fold over, constant fold over. I will tell you, I will tell you real quick, one, one great way to minimize your time in the gym is to utilize a push-pull type of routine, agonist, antagonist. So I work chest along with back. So if I do a push, say any kind of vertical push overhead, say, let's, let's talk uh, vertical pushing and pulling. Push over the head, I come back, I do some kind of pull, some kind of pull up. As I'm doing that pull up, the, uh, the agonists, my shoulders are now being forced to relax because the antagonists are now working as this physiological response. Use that kind of stuff, I can, tr I can really shorten my period of time in the gym too. So I take that into consideration. So I guess the answer to your question is, again, it depends. <laughs> and the other question, you kind of touched upon it already, was just wanted to know how you feel about um, what's become very trendy in exercise, which is um, CrossFit. Sure. And um, trying to keep your heartbeat accelerated during the entire workout mm -hmm. and having shorter workouts. Yeah. Um, first of all, CrossFit, I, I love some aspects of CrossFit. Some aspects of CrossFit I think could be improved. I think it's a great idea, and I use a lot of CrossFit-like, um, how can we say, structure within my workouts. Um, where I think the downfall to CrossFit is, is the programming. I think the programming could be a little bit uh, more pre-planned. I'm totally, I'm totally down with the whole idea of being able to reach in a hopper, grab things out, and a good athlete ought to be able to to do well on these 
on these techniques, he ought to be able to do well. I, I totally, I'm totally down with that. What I, what I don't agree with, it, there's a difference between testing and, and uh, training. You don't, you don't train with a test all the time. That's a way to get hurt real quick. You train for a test, if that makes any sense at all. Um, but yeah, uh, for the most part, uh, the CrossFit stuff I love. I like the, uh, I like the structure of it. I just, I manipulate my, there's a little bit more pre-planning in my workouts. In, in other words, it, I don't see the necessity in doing a, an Olympic derivative lift, say a snatch or a power clean under fatigue and under a high rep situation. I, it's, just, it's just not a good recipe. They, 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 you, get, you can do better things than that. So that, that, that's, my only, that's my only knock on them. I really like what you said about uh, changing the tempo. Yeah. Um, so my question is for those of us who are working out towards a specific goal. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, my goal right now is just mass. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm working um, low reps, mm -hmm. high weight, and very, very slow, five seconds up, five seconds down. Um, how often would you recommend changing the tempo? In other words, was it when we hit a plateau or mm -hmm. just ever so often? And then when we do change the tempo, uh, would you recommend just changing it for one workout or for a certain period of time and then going back? Yeah. So, first of all, you need to define what, for you, what a plateau is and what tools you're, you're utilizing. So, if you're utilizing, uh, I'm assuming you're utilizing machines, yes, or is this? Mostly. Yeah. Mostly, yeah. Um, I would get back to more of the auto regulation part of it okay so if you can if there is some way you can structure these workouts to where you can auto regulate them okay. okay you go back to the auto regulation then within auto regulation that same exercise after you plane out let's say you're doing a, a five second up uh, five second eccentric five second concentric okay try changing that concentric to as fast as possible on the way up Okay, once you hit that plateau is what, once you hit the plateau on your other, if, if, that's your, if that's your base camp, if that's your home, if that's where you found that, that's where you operate the best from, that would be the first place to deviate. Okay, now, instead of coming up slow and controlled, let's try uh, for a while, let's try coming up explosively. Okay, and let's auto-regulate that for a while. And for a while, I mean, until you, until you plateau there. Gotcha. Then step back. Go back to your old five second up, five second down, okay, and then hit it again. Bam, jump right back into it, and more than likely you will have exceeded. Yeah. Okay. See where I'm at, and then, then you go back through it again, and it's a constant. Like I say, there is no end point. You know, there's there's no point that you're gonna be okay. This is all said and done. Now I've got it figured out, and and that, here I am. It, it's constant. It's a constant change. You know what I mean? So then, so then you come back and then you plateau again. Then you find some other thing to change. Maybe it's tempo again. Maybe now you're mentally burnt out on this particular exercise, whatever it is, and you need to move on to a different exercise because that can play into it too. Just the mental burnout of performing a certain exercise, especially a machine-based exercise, is, is pretty heavy. You know what I mean? You, you go into the gym every day, you're like, Jesus Christ, you know, I'm back here on this machine again, five by five again. You, you just, your tenacity and your intensity just starts to, to playing off that way. So if nothing else, just to break, th break through that mental, that mental barrier, change the tempo on the same machine. Then it feels like a whole new exercise. Sure. You know what I mean? Yep. And then you go on from there and you just, you're just constantly folding over, folding over, folding over, folding over. Yep. Yeah, this is a question more about recovery yeah. and uh, in possibly nutrition. I, I get bored if I work out once a week sure. or even twice a week. And so oftentimes I'll overdo it. And I, I don't really lift weights too much, but I probably, you know, maybe I should. I should probably talk to you since you I'm You should, yeah. But I'll do like plyometrics or I'll do running or distance running, which you told me a lot about when I yep. met, met yep. with you with Anthony. With Anthony, 
But even in training, like right now, I do like five days a week of stuff like jiu-jitsu, which can be really hard on your joints. What is the best, I I mean, supplementation, diet, what's the best way to recover to get your body in a progressive? Yeah, yeah, okay, so so just where people have uh, genetic predispositions to be um, good athletes, have good physiques, there's also genetic predisposition to recovery as well, which kind of plays into that whole thing. So number one, your genetics plays a huge. Um, personally, I know that I am very good on the recovery side of things, that I can recover from workout, and I always have been, so that I can work out many days a week if I do it smart, in which I do. So I enhance that. But I can recover from very strenuous workouts very quick. So that's one thing you need to know, know thyself, number one there. You know, where, where are you genetically? Okay, now we talk about the type of workout you're doing as it relates to what you can do to enhance recovery. So there's kind of two, two balls in the air right here. The biggest thing you can do recovery-wise, I mean, it's generic, okay, sleep. Sleep is huge. Reduce your cortisol, reduce your life stresses everywhere else. Those are the two biggest things. Cortisol, sleep, bam, bam. If you get control of those two, you will find that, number one, you'll recover quicker. Number two, if you recover quicker, that means you can work out harder and uh, more frequently on the other side. As far as supplementation, I think the best supplement as far as recovery goes is ZMA. It's easy. It's a, ZMA is the best, about the best supplement. You can, and it's, it's simply zinc, zinc thing. How do you reduce cortisol? Reduce stress. Question was how do you reduce cortisol? Yeah. Reduce stress. How do you reduce how do you reduce uh, cortisol? Reduce stress. Question I want to add real quick sure. is vitamin D. Does it play a role in recovery? Yeah, vitamin D is huge as well. I would opt more for natural vitamin D than a supplement vitamin D, but I don't shy away from the I don't shy away from the supplemental vitamin D either. Um, I take quite a bit of it, about uh, five thousand IU's a day and I'm out in the sun quite a bit. Um, but the, the, the vitamin D uh, blood serum levels, are, it's pretty cheap blood test. Get yourself tested, find out where you are, supplement accordingly, it's not a very, it's not a very expensive test. I can guarantee you, even being in Florida and being out quite a bit, you're probably low, just about everybody is low. And that's huge. It, it, uh, quick aside from that, um, the East Germans back in the day, I'm kind of an East German aficionado coming from the, coming from the old school back in the day, the guys, uh, you know, steroids aside, those guys had it going on. They were, they were extremely, extremely, not even training-wise, supplement-wise, they had it going on. Um, and, and we're still now behind where they were then as far as, as, far as uh, sports knowledge, as far as how to train, how to recover supplements. So just saying that, I'll just say in closing that the East Germans were big on vitamin D supplementation in huge amounts, so something to really, really pay heed to. Well, guys, I've enjoyed it. Um, any of you guys want to hit me up personally outside of here? I'd love to talk to you because this is an N equals one game. Just always, always remember that. It's an N equals one game. You can look to other people for hints, um, but it comes down to where you fit on that health performance curve. Where you are, where you want to be, it all comes down to that. Place yourself on that curve, determine where you want to go, then start going out and picking tools and techniques to help get you there. If you need to, uh, if you have the desire to talk to me about it, I can certainly get you pointed in the right direction. I've enjoyed talking to you guys. Thanks a lot for having me.